Λεύ Κούλεσοφ, Σεργέι Άιζενστάιν, Τζίγκα Βερτόφ. Whether these names ring a bell or not, these filmmakers played a key role in the history of cinema with their unique ideas and techniques about editing. And not only. These filmmakers, along with other directors, would support that editing is an art and the most essential part in the construction of a film. On today's episode, in our History of Cinema series, we will speak about Soviet Mondas, a movement that defined how we understand cinema through editing, and we will discuss about the most important movies during the 1920s in the newly formed Soviet Union. Let's begin. We will begin with some general history facts about the conditions in this part of the world from 1917 till the end of the 1920s. These facts will help us understand how the film industry was established during the first years of Soviet Union. The Russian Empire was participating in the World War I, but people in Russia were against that. In February 1917, a revolution took place which overthrew Tsar Nicholas II and a provisional government was established. Nevertheless, the workers were not happy with this government and the Bolshevik party, with the leadership of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, aka Lenin, took the power after the October Revolution. However, a civil war started right after the revolution between the Reds and the Whites. It lasted almost six years, although by 1920 most of the areas of the former empire were under the control of the Reds and had a huge blast to the economy. But I can hear you say, what all these facts have to do with cinema? We'll get there. You see, Russia and the other states, which would later form the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics, were not manufacturing countries. They were not producing film, cameras, and in general, raw stock, but they were importing it from abroad. Most of the people who had access to raw stock were supporting the whites and fled the country after the October Revolution. This left the country without any material for creating new films. For most of us, This would have been a terrible condition, but not for the Soviets. In 1918, they created the People's Commissariat for Education, also known as Narkompros, a regulatory body to oversee and assist the new attempts on cinema. In 1919, the first film school in the world opened in Moscow. It was called VGIK, or All Russian State Institute of Cinematography, and it was founded by the director Vladimir Garden. The new filmmakers realized that since they could not produce new films, it would be more constructive to analyze the already existing films, both from pre-revolutionary Russia and from abroad, in order to learn more about this new medium. And this is where we meet Lev Kulesov. Lev Vladimirovich Kulesov had already started in cinema before the October Revolution and directed his film The Project of Engineer Pride in 1917, although it was released in 1918, but he was more interested For the film theory. He became teacher at VGIK and he created a small group where they could work on acting and how to stage in front of a camera, even though they didn't have cameras and films. But Lev Kulesov would stay in history with the experiment that was named later after his name, the Kulesov effect. Kulesov took a shot of the face of Ivan Mozukin, one of the most famous Russian actors prior to revolution, and then he was showing various other shots. First, He projected a bowl of soup. People who were watching this shot thought that Mozukin was hungry. Then he showed Mozukin's face and the next shot was a little girl in a coffin. Everyone assumed that Mozukin was sad. In the last experiment, he showed again the same shot of Mozukin and the next shot was a woman in a bed. Everybody thought that Mozukin was looking at the woman with lust. With this experiment, Kulesov wanted to highlight the importance of editing. He realized that the audience reacts to a sequence of shots based on their own emotional beliefs and they project these reactions to the actor they see on the screen. According to that, two unrelated shots can create a new meaning, and that would be the basis of Montas theory, which is used now in movies one century after Kulesov. And this was not Kulesov's only contribution to the Montas theory. Kulesov invented the creative geography technique. You may not have heard the term before, but it happens all the time on films and TV series. According to that technique, multiple segments shot at different locations when edited together can appear to all occur in a continuous space and time. We can see this example in his movie that we mentioned earlier, 
the project of Virgin Pride. In one shot, the men look the electric poles outside in the fields. In the next shot, we see the electric poles. However, the men and the poles were not in the same location, but appear to be so due to editing. Kulesov would direct 20 movies during his career, with some of them considered now lost. We would recommend his 1924 movie, The Extraordinary Adventures of Mr. West in the Land of the Bolsheviks, a satire about the misconceptions the people from USA had about the Bolsheviks and the situation in the Soviet Union. Keep an eye also on his 1926 movie, By the Law, a psychological drama based on a short story by Jack London. Kulesov directed his last movie, We from the Urals, in 1943, and then he worked as an artistic director and teacher at VGIK until his death in 1970. A truly exceptional filmmaker who gave a new meaning to the art of Montas. Moving on, we will spend some time to speak about Sergei Mikhailovich Eisenstein, one of the most important directors and film theorists of all times. Eisenstein studied architecture and engineering, but then joined the Russian army and after the civil war he went to work on theater, next to Vsevolod Meyerhold, a theater director who was teaching his actors to use their body as a machine which would make them express their feelings and emotions better with their body than with words. Eisenstein produced a short film that was shown during a theatrical play and there he realized that cinema was his true passion. In 1924, Eisenstein started filming his first full-length feature film, Strike, which would be released in 1925. The film depicts a strike that took place in 1903 by workers in a factory. It is arranged in six parts and some of Eisenstein's theories about montage will be shown in this film. The montage of attractions is one of them. According to the montage of attractions, the audience will be moved to react physically, emotionally and politically if it is shown sudden bursts of aggressive movement. This happens throughout Strike, a movie which has too many shots juxtaposed one to another. But the most famous theory he will put into action from his first film is the intellectual montage. According to intellectual montage, a few shots totally unrelated together can create a new meaning that can be understood by different audiences. It goes one step further to Kulesov's theories because, in Eisenstein's case, some of the images are not diegetic, meaning that they have nothing to do with the movie which is shown. The best example comes from the strike. Workers are being attacked by the police and in the next shot we see bulls being slaughtered in a slaughterhouse. The bulls and the butchers were never shown before in the movie, they are out of its context, but when shown together with the workers being defeated, it gives a new symbolic meaning. Strike is an excellent revolutionary film and our rating is 8.5 out of 10 stars. Eisenstein's next film, Battleship Potemkin, will be his masterpiece and one of the best movies ever made. Released in 1925, Battleship Potemkin depicts the real story of a mutiny that took place in 1905 when the crew of Battleship Potemkin rebelled against its officers and the events later in Odessa. The film is divided in five acts and it was produced in order to commemorate the 20 years of the unsuccessful rebellion. Along with the modus of attractions, Eisenstein will also establish the rhythmic modus in this film. The movements within frames are as important as lengths of shots and as we arrive closer to the climax, the rhythm becomes more tense. The most famous example comes from the Odessa steps sequence. In the beginning, the cheerful crowd of Odessa waves to the sailors and the atmosphere is happy. But then, the Tsarist troops appear and the situation becomes rigid. The smiles disappear and terror reigns. However, this happens gradually and as we approach to the famous scene with a baby carriage rolling down the steps, the shots become shorter and the rhythm is more tense, creating a unique in the history of cinema ambience where anxiety, fear and hatred for the soldiers get all mixed together. We could praise all day Eisenstein for his innovative editing techniques, but Eisenstein was also a great director. He knew perfectly to work with big crowds and orchestrate them so he could get the best shots possible. Faithful to his Marxist beliefs, he was making the crowds the main protagonist of his films in order to show the key role of the proletariat in the new society. And he could accomplish that also 
with the tipaz, meaning that the actors were casted based on their physical or personal similarity to a character they had to depict. For example, in Strike, the greed capitalists are fat and old, while the workers are young, thin and poor, and you can see that to their faces. Something similar happens also to Battleship Potemkin, with the starving sailors to be thin and their faces skinny, while the officers are old with the characteristic look of hatred in their eyes. Battleship Potemkin is a perfect example of revolutionary propaganda, and it never hides it. It clearly takes the position of the sailors against their officers, and then the massive crowd against the soldiers. When Ledin said, of all the arts, for us, cinema is the most important, he would have been totally happy with the result of Eisenstein's movie and praised it as the perfect example of what he wanted cinema to be. But Lenin never saw the movie as he died in 1924. Battles in Potemkin is one of the masterpieces of the silent era, and not only. You will find it in all the lists with the best movies ever made, and our rating for this film is 9 out of 10 stars. After the success he earned from Battles in Potemkin, Eisenstein was commissioned to direct a film about the October Revolution in order to commemorate its 10th anniversary. October is a dramatization of the events before and during the October Revolution. For one more time, the crowds play an important role in the movie as they are the main protagonist, although now we will have some clear characters such as Kerensky and Lenin. Eisenstein will experiment with metric montage in this film, where the editing follows a specific number of frames, cutting to the next shot, no matter what is happening within the image. The reviews for October were not enthusiastic, comparing to his prior films, and he was even accused as formalist. By that, they meant that he paid too much attention on the technicalities, and this would make it harder for the audience to understand its meaning. However, we believe that it is a great depiction of the events that led to the October Revolution, which would shake the world, and our rating for this film is 8 out of 10 stars. Eisenstein had started filming the general line, also known as The Older Than You, before October, but he had to stop to film the latter. When he returned to the general line, he had to do a massive editing, as the film was supposed to be hailing Leon Trotsky, an old revolutionary, but in the end of the 1920s, Trotsky was treated as an enemy by the state. The movie was not successful, as Eisenstein could use only a small part of what he had actually shot. After that, Eisenstein, along with the director Grigory Alexandrov and cinematographer Edward Tisse, left Soviet Union to learn about sound motion pictures, but Eisenstein took the chance to explore the world and make new movies there, mostly in Mexico. Next on our list is Giga Vertov. He is considered more radical in the modest movement compared to Kules of Eisenstein because he was opposing the idea of fiction films and he was praising the documentaries as they were closer to truth. He would try to depict this truth in his Kino Pravda series. Along with his wife and editor, Elisaveta Svilova, and his younger brother and cinematographer, Mikhail Kaufman, they tried to capture fragments of actuality which, when organized together, showed a deeper truth which could not be seen with the naked eye. He focused on the daily life of the working class and he compared it with bourgeois schemes. They would film in public and private spaces, sometimes without informing the people around, so they could capture their real lives and reactions. Vertov believed in the Cinei, a method that he tried to use in his films. By shooting newsreels around the country during the Civil War, he believed in the new society that was built under the Communist Party. Through Cinei, he thought that man could reach the level of the machine and a flawless art could be created. He was heavily opposing the fiction films and would disagree with the party's approach to films like Battles of Potemkin. In 1926, Vertov will direct the film A Sixth Part of the World, a documentary which presents the vast Soviet Union and the multitude of its people from east to the west. Vertov and his team spread around the country and when editing, they want to show a compilation of the new society that was born. His next film, The Eleventh Year, released in 1928, has a similar topic, as it is showing the hard labor of the countrymen in the industrial production in order to make Soviet Union the strongest economy in the world. The huge recognition for Giga Vertov and his team would come in 1929 with the movie Man with a Movie Camera. 
Elizaveta Svilova was again the editor and also appears in the movie. His brother, Mikhail Kaufman, was the cinematographer and also the famous man with the movie camera. The film was shot in the streets of Moscow, Kiev, and Odessa and shows the everyday life of daily citizens. There are no actors in the film. Even more than being just a documentary showing the daily life of the people, Man with a Movie Camera is a process of how a film is being made. We see how the cinematographer controls the camera, how the editor chooses which frames to use, etc. Although it is shot in various locations in different cities, we feel as everything happens in one place. Vertov, faithful to his Marxist ideology, tried to highlight the achievements the communists have accomplished after the revolution. Vertov and Svilova employed almost all the known editing techniques. There are shots in fast motion and others in slow motion. There are freeze frames which make us think that we see a still photograph and later there will be jump cuts which create the effect of jumping forward in time. There are extreme close-ups with the most famous one being the eye close-up. And also there are tracking shots like the ones we see when they drive around the cities. Man with a movie camera did not receive good reviews upon its release. It was accused of emphasizing on form over content. However, filmmakers in the 60s would reevaluate his work and give him the recognition he deserves. In 1969, the legendary Jean Luc Godard, along with the filmmaker Jean-Pierre Gauguin, would form the Giga Vertov Group, inspired by the legendary Soviet filmmaker. In 2022, the magazine Sight and Sound held a poll with the top 100 greatest films of all times and Man with a Movie Camera is ranked 9th. Our rating for this film is 9 out of 10 stars. In this episode, we speak about Soviet Mondas theory and also for important movies that took place during the 20s in the newly formed Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics. And next on our list is Vsevolod Ilarionovich Pudovkin. His first full-length feature film, Mother, was released in 1926. Based on Maxim Gorky's novel with the same title, this movie will bring him immediate success. In Mother, we follow the story of Pelagia, a woman who has suffered a lot from her abusive husband and later sees her son imprisoned for being a revolutionary. She tries her best so her family stays away from troubles, but eventually she realizes that her son's ideas were correct and the workers should strike. We can easily distinguish some differences between Eisenstein and Podovkin, both on Modas, and in general in direction. Where Eisenstein believed that montage is the power of collision between shots, Pudovkin insisted that montage should be the creation of a theme and that all the necessary information should be within one shot and not on different shots which collide with each other. Regarding direction, while Eisenstein did not have one protagonist but the masses were the protagonists of his movies, Pudovkin will focus on the individuals. He strongly believed that by showing the struggle of an individual and his, her understanding of the communist ideology through battles was the only way for the Soviet people to become more conscious and fight for the new society they wanted to create. We totally recommend you to watch The Mother and our rating is 8 out of 10 stars. In 1927, Pudovkin, like Eisenstein, was commissioned to direct a movie in order to commemorate the 10 years from October Revolution and he created the end of St. Petersburg, where we follow the story of a peasant boy who betrays his class, then becomes a soldier, but in the end, he realizes that Bolsheviks are on the right side of the history, he convinces his fellow soldiers to join the Bolsheviks, and they attack the Winter Palace. Although there are scenes with big crowds, Pudovkin remains faithful to his ideology about Montas, and the way he portrays the boy clarifies once again his way of changing the world. The end of St. Petersburg is not as formalistic as October was, and it is easier for the audiences to understand it. It has also great artistic value and mastery, and our rating is 8 out of 10 stars. In 1928, Pudovkin will finalize his Bolshevik trilogy with the movie Storm Over Asia, and we have again the same pattern. A man who supports the Soviets then becomes a puppet of the British capitalists, but in the end, he betrays them and supports the Soviets. Pudovkin leaves Europe in order to create a fictional story taking place in Mongolia. But the analogy is always the same. It is a propaganda film, only this time focusing on British capitalists as the enemies who exploit the Mongolians. We have excellent long shots, breathtaking close-ups 
with a humanistic approach to the rituals and environment of the Mongolians. Although its duration is over two hours, we believe that you will enjoy this movie and we will rate it also with 8 out of 10 stars. Before leaving the Russian territory, we will have to mention the factory of the eccentric actor, formed by Grigory Kozintsev, Leonid Trauberg, and Sergei Yutkevich. This factory wanted to celebrate the circus, the cabarets, and other mass media entertainments by using, though, the modest theories that were developed at that time in the Soviet Union. Kozintsev and Trauberg's movie, The Adventures of Octiabrina, released in 1924, was an attempt to put into action their ideas. Unfortunately, the movie is now lost. Kozintsev and Trauberg continued directing together, and their biggest success was the 1926 movie The Overcoat, based on a short story by the famous novelist Nikolai Gogol. Captivating long shots and very stylized close-ups, along with the vivid acting of the actors, which was even grotesque at some point, made this movie very popular to Soviet Union, and our rating is 7.5 out of 10 stars. We are leaving now Russia and go to Ukraine in order to speak about Oleksandr Petrovich Dovsenko. He entered into filmmaking at the age of 32 and gained recognition with his 1928 movie Svenigora, which is a movie about an old man telling a story to his grandson about a treasure buried in the mountain. This is the initial film in Dovsenko's Ukraine trilogy with Arsenal, released in 1929, and Earth, released in 1930, completing that trilogy. Arsenal presents the story of a young man, Timos, who returns to Kyiv after having seen the exploitation of working class and wants this situation to change. He becomes actively involved in the Bolshevik movement and fights for the revolution. The excellent camera movement shows the dedication Dovsenko put in his work, which he didn't want to be only a propaganda film, but the real depiction of the conditions his people had to overcome in the times before and after the October Revolution. It is a highly praised film, and our rating is 8 out of 10 stars. Our plan was to speak about movies till 1929, but we will have to comment Dovsenko's third film of his trilogy, Earth, released in 1930, and considered by many film critics as one of the best silent movies ever made. And we will not disagree with them. The excellent presentation of the Ukrainian countryside, the magnificent close-ups of the unnamed peasants, the poetic insight and humanistic approach to his characters make Dovsenko one of the masters of cinema during the silent era, and since we don't want to reveal more about this film, our rating is 8.5 out of 10 stars, and we will let you discover it. Before we finish our episode, we will have to mention Esfir Ilinitsna Sub, a pioneer filmmaker and editor, she is considered to be the creator of compilation films. By compilation films, we mean the gathering of material from different movies, newsreels, etc., and editing them in order to create one unique film. She is best known for her film, Fall of the Romanov Dynasty, released in 1927. Sub had to discover and then examine more than 60,000 meters of film in order to choose the final material for her movie. The inner title she used managed to give a great historical context to the audience, but her mastery comes during the editing. On one hand, she shows the fancy, rich lifestyle of the Romanov dynasty, and on the other side, she presents exceptionally the struggles of the working class, a great and innovative work which paved the way to the compilation films. Our rating is 8 out of 10 stars. And that was the end of our episode. We tried to review the most important movies during the 1920s in the Soviet Union, and we spoke about the innovative directors who gave new power to the art of montas. We hope that you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. As always, you will find in the description all the movies that we mentioned with their English title, the year they were released, and the name of their director. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe to our channel. This is how you show your support to us. Till next time, stay safe and watch movies.